In this episode, we take a look at a new edition of my deck of the year for 2018. We give you a chance to win one of these highly limited decks from me in one of two special giveaways you are not going to want to miss. And we announce the winner of the Revival Cycles Motorcycle Show playing cards. Plus, I answer some of your questions here on camera. All that coming up next. It's no secret I'm a rabid fan of Lorenzo Gagiotti, known to many as the artist and designer of the Stockholm 17 playing cards brand. But I'm also, in full disclosure, a business partner of his. No doubt many of you who supported the Parlor Playing Cards campaign already knew that. As a quick aside, I'm excited to announce that the Parlor supporters should be on the verge of receiving their decks very soon if you haven't already. The Parlor campaign was announced way back on New Year's Eve in 2018 at the end of my top 10 decks of 2018 video. In that episode, my number one deck of 2018 also designed by Lorenzo was the House of the Rising Spade Gatekeeper Edition, a beautifully designed deck with a gorgeously illustrated collection of court cards. Cardamundi's gold cold foil on the front and backs and a spectacular tuck box. As we're near the end of 2019, Lorenzo has created a new highly limited edition of the House of the Rising Spade deck and in this episode, I'm gonna show it to you. I'm the Gentleman Wake and you're watching the best channel for discerning playing cards enthusiasts. Make sure to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell if you haven't already. The main distinction of the Room 17 deck with regards to the original House of the Rising Spade release is twofold. The newly designed tuck case and gold gilded edges. More on the gilding a bit later. First, let's focus on the tuck case. The gorgeous tuck printed by Lotrex Oath Playing Cards uses high quality matte red cardstock and features deep embossing and red and gold foil printing. The front of the box features a gold foil spade rife with scroll work die cut key. Hole. The entirety of the remaining tuck box real estate is covered in embossed runic symbols that are a promise of a deeper mystery hidden within the deck. The House of the Rising Spade decks were originally available in the Faro White Edition, which I previewed back in March of 2018 on this channel, and the Black Cardamancer Edition. The Cardamancer Edition in a more elaborate box was also the basis for the Gatekeeper variant. All three were printed as a limited production run as part of a Kickstarter campaign that shipped in 2018. However, as is often the case with playing cards manufacturers, deck production runs are never exact. Manufacturers like Cardamundi take into account potential printing errors and or press malfunctions, and they usually print inflated counts to make sure that they can cover any potential loss that you know, might occur and ensure that the addition sizes of customer orders are met. What ends up happening usually is that printing goes off without too much of an issue, which of course leaves a certain number of extra decks. This was the case with the Cardamancer edition of the House of the Rising Spade printed by Cardamundi. About 800 additional naked decks, that is decks that lacked tuck boxes, remained after the fulfillment of the initial Kickstarter campaign. Rather than see those decks collect dust in his attic, Lorenzo chose to create a new tuck box and package those overflow decks as the new Room 17 edition. Even then, the final count of the Room 17 edition is actually 680 decks. To further differentiate this new release, Lorenzo also decided to add gilding, and he also included a secret mystery quest hidden within the design of the new tuck box. Additionally, he promised some prizes to the first few folks to accurately decipher and solve the puzzles. More on that a bit later. The sides of the box feature no obvious copy, although they too are covered end to end in gold foil embossed runes. The top of the box features the deck branding and a gold foil frame with more runes inside. At first glance, the prominence of these makes them feel like the key to beginning to solve the mystery. The back of the box is also wallpapered with runes, these embossed in red foil. There's a numbered gold foil sticker seal in the center that reveals the edition size of 680. The bottom of the box has some 
some additional ad copy, including the logos for Stockholm 17, Oath Playing Cards, and Cardamundi. Over the course of a few previous videos, I've already shown you most of the beautiful cards inside the box. So I won't go into too much detail here. I advise you to check out those earlier reviews for more insight. I will, however, point out that with regards to the artwork, this deck is identical to the content of the Black Cardomancer edition previously released. It's the same ad cards, jokers, spot cards, and amazing court cards as well. Cardamundi's gold cold foil process is on full display on the front and backs. In fact, it was the border in gold on the front of the cards that inspired the gold borders on the backs of the parlor deck black and dynastine editions. The one distinction when it comes to the cards is the bold gold gilded edges. Gilded at the Cardamundi facility in France dedicated to gilding, the quality is exceptional. It's the same gilding process used by Andre Shinishka on his butterfly decks as well as the Parlor Dynastine edition. The cards, once initially separated, handle magnificently. Springs and cascades are wonderful. Even despite the gold edges, farrowing the deck is easy. The cards are printed on Cardamundi Superlux cardstock with the B9 True Linen finish, and it's one of my favorite stock and finish combinations. In fact, it makes me at once lament that this cardstock is now discontinued and joyful that the parlor deck project was fortunate enough to have been printed before it was discontinued. All in all, a truly gorgeous deck of cards that for me remains in the highest esteem. The decks are actually still available, although there's no telling how long the stock will last considering the limited print run. Visit stockholm17.com to buy yours. I'm giving away one of these decks, but you'll have to stay tuned for how to enter that giveaway. One more thing regarding the deck before we move on to the Q&A section. The mystery quest Lorenzo included has already been solved with prizes going to four lucky participants who correctly broke the code and deciphered the mystery. What follows is a quick spoiler filled explanation of the quest. So if you plan on buying this deck and solving the quest for yourself, you may want to skip ahead to the time code on the screen. Also included in the deck is a quest key card with some hints to get folks started. As I suspected, the frame runes on the top of the box are in fact the first decipherable clues. They lead to a couple of IG posts that result in a few additional keys used for deciphering additional runes. Eventually, this leads to decoding the entire passage, which reveals a beautifully written tragedy of the love shared between the King of Spades and the Queen of Diamonds, and the ultimate goal of the quest, the true name of the Diamond Queen, Millicrystalis. It's a gorgeous parable by writer Regina Hoppengardner, also known as at Cardomancy Tales on Instagram. It manages to detail a bittersweet story of jealousy and longing and ultimately romantic tragedy, and it manages to do it in a few short paragraphs. I urge you to pause the video and take it in for yourself. All right, well, some time ago in a previous video, I asked you guys to chime in and ask me anything and the time has come for the answer. So I'm gonna try and get through as many of these as I can, but pay attention because at the end of this video, I'm not only going to be giving away a Room 17 deck, but also a Parlor Dynastine deck. All right, there were a lot of great questions. So if I don't answer your specific question, just keep asking it. Hopefully one day I will get to it. Having said that, quite a few folks had the same similar or related question. So in the case of those, I just answered the first one I came across. All right, so here we go. Question number one. Ardashir Yousefi, I hope I'm saying that right, asks, what is your favorite deck of all time? Well, actually, it's kind of hard to answer that right now, considering I just put out my first deck, which I guess technically is my favorite deck of all time. I do have some other favorite decks. I am not going to spoil that, though, in this video. I'm going to hold those for my top 10 decks of all time video, which I plan to do sometime early next year. Slava Koblov asks, how do you do some of those amazing cardistry tricks? Slava, I don't know if you're being sarcastic <laughs> or not. Uh, I don't think my cardistry is amazing at all. In fact, I am very much still a beginner. I don't practice nearly as much as I should. 
Having said that, what I can do, I learned from YouTube by watching some amazing tutorials by other cardists and magicians out there in the social media space. So I advise you, if you wanna learn how to do cardistry, just type in how to do cardistry in the YouTube search window and you should find a bunch of great videos. Norbert asks, when did you figure out you love cards and how did it come to be? The fact is, is I've always loved playing cards. I remember my dad and my uncle playing cards in the house when I was little and also my grandfather and his friends playing poker and gin. And as I got older, I started to play poker in tournaments myself. But the reality is a few years ago, I really started to look at cards for their aesthetic value. As a creative and an artist myself, I really gained a vast appreciation for what people were doing when they were designing playing cards. Sunny Chiba asks, what got you into card collecting and what was the first deck you put in your collection? Well, what's funny is I think what got me into this modern era of card collecting actually is probably Chris Ramsey. Uh, I learned about Chris Ramsey's channel watching Peter McKinnon uh, and honestly I, there was something about it. He showed his playing card collection in a couple of videos and I was really kind of enamored with it. Uh, I started to search playing card reviews, got a chance to see some reviews by some other reviewers on YouTube and I really kind of got caught the collecting bug so to speak. I want to say that the first deck I had in my collection was probably the Bicycle White Tigers deck. I, I bought it at a Walgreens. 1004DA asks, will your wife do any more reviews or take over your channel in the future? Between you and me, Lady Wake will definitely be back probably sooner rather than later. Jamie asks, has the Lady Wake caught any of the collecting bug or is she just super supportive of this strange hobby? It's the second part. <laughs> to be honest, Lady Wake has no interest in collecting playing cards. And, and really, it's more about just being tolerant rather than supportive. <laughs> Card Perfect Magician asks, is YouTube your full-time job? Card Perfect Magician, I wish it was my full-time job. It would be fantastic. I would love nothing more than to devote myself full-time to making videos for you guys. Unfortunately, right now, the size of my channel, the current number of views that I get is not enough to translate into being able to pay the bills, which means I actually have a IRL job outside of YouTube. Actually, for the last about, I'd say 20 years or so, I've been paying the bills as an editor, director, and producer of broadcast television promotional content, as well as creative content for online distribution. So basically that answers the question of why my stuff looks the way that it looks. It's just been a lot of years of doing this kind of thing professionally that I've applied to making YouTube videos. But ultimately my goal is definitely to give myself full time to this brand, not just the channel, but rather the, the channel and everything associated around it. Asher Buck asks, how much revenue do you earn on YouTube? The reality is YouTube revenue is not great, especially on a channel that's kind of small like mine. I'm putting it up on the screen here, but you can see here how much money I make for a video that's about 10 minutes or more in length after about 28 days of publishing. It's pretty much gas money. Technology asks, how do you manage your day job with the time consumed by these high quality reviews and editing? Are you deciding to go full time on the TGW brand? The reality is I don't manage it very well. <laughs> I'm constantly against deadlines and missing my own self-imposed kind of published dates because I usually fall behind. Um, it's hard when you're balancing a job that's actually more than 40 hours a week. I end up working about 50 hours a week. So when I do get home and I do have free time to start working on the videos you see here, it's pretty much all consuming of my free time. Again, I'd love to take the brand into a full-time direction, but it's just gonna be a little while before we can get to that. Uh, that's why things like Patreon are so valuable. Patreon right now, it doesn't represent a huge amount of money, but hopefully over time, the patronage will grow and we'll be able to devote more and more time. Because of course, the more income and the more revenue we get from 
other sources, other passive sources like YouTube and Patreon, the less time I'll have to spend actually working for a living to pay the bills. So that is the goal, definitely. Ian129 says, you seem like a channel with 1 million plus subs, but you only have a few thousand. How do you do it? Where do you get time or budget? <laughs> That's a good question, Ian. Thank you so much, number one, for that tremendous compliment. We really try hard to make sure that the videos you watch on this channel look as good as possible, that they feel good and are entertaining to watch, and also that we bring you as much value as we can. But the reality is the budget comes out of our own pockets. All of the equipment we have, cameras, lights, audio equipment, are all investments that we make in our own business which of course is to create content, not just for the YouTube channel here and for Lady Waits YouTube channel, but for other work related to production. We don't really have any other help. There isn't any assistants or cameramen or editors. We do everything on our own. So really eventually one day, we'd like to get to the point where we can expand the team and make more investments in production uh, so that we can increase the quality and the value that we provide for you. Marathon asks, what is your proudest moment in your YouTube career? That's a good question. Honestly, I had a channel previous to this one where I only had about 1200 subscribers. So the day I kind of crossed the threshold to have more than that first channel, that was a proud, significant moment for me. But I think also getting to collaborate with some much bigger channels like Alex Pandrea and 52 Cards, AKA Assad, those were really pretty amazing experiences and uh, as well as meeting Dave and Dan Buck of Art of Play, that was pretty cool. But honestly, I think the most pride I've ever felt in relation to the YouTube channel is in fact the Parlor campaign, the Kickstarter campaign. That campaign was amazing beyond our wildest expectations. We were thrilled with the success that we had. We didn't do it by ourselves. Lorenzo, AKA Stockholm 17 brought his audience as well. But you know, a lot of the folks who backed that campaign were people who watch this channel. And ultimately that is the greatest compliment that they could pay me uh, is to support something that we're doing uh, because they enjoy the content that we give them. Lai Jun Yan asks, what deck would you prefer for beginner magic and cardistry handing that are not so expensive too? Honestly, the best deck that you could use to practice cardistry and magic is the standard deck, the bicycle rider back. They aren't very expensive. They're pretty easy to come by, especially if you're in the United States, of course. They are the best quality deck of cards you can get for a very low price. The One asks, do you like magic? What are your thoughts about it? The One, I do enjoy magic. I'm not very good at it myself, but I am always in awe of folks who can do magic. The sleight of hand, especially when I watch somebody who knows what they're doing, uh, their technical skill, it's just, it's really amazing. I'm actually quite envious of how good they are. Max asks, how many cards do you own and how do you store them? Max, I have no idea how many cards I have. I really, I just be guessing, but I would probably say a thousand decks. A thousand? <laughs> 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 but I don't store them in anything special or specific. They just kind of exist on some shelves in some glass cabinets in my office. Lael's Art Loa asks, could you invite Chris Ramsey sometime? <laughs> yes, yes, please. Actually, I've been trying to reach out to Chris Ramsey on Twitter, trying to get his attention. In fact, guys, put in a good word. Dan Fox asks, how do you film your cardistry slash magic move highlights? Do you use a tripod or a second person? Dan, uh, I'm looking forward to putting together a behind the scenes video detailing the process of creating these deck reviews. So you guys can see from start to finish what goes into making them. That includes writing and pre-production as well as how I actually shoot the deck reviews. To answer your question, however, it's not a tripod or a second person. You're gonna have to wait for that video to see how I do it. Wolfgang Buck says, love the channel and vids. Thank you very much, Wolfgang. And what would you do differently with the parlor deck if you could? That experience is probably one of the coolest experiences I've ever had, second to marrying my wife, of course. I wouldn't change anything about it. I think it was perfect. Uh, I couldn't have asked for a more 
satisfying experience than that campaign. Jesse G, the fantastic magician asks, I'm wondering what was it that gave you the idea for your cards? What inspired you the most? The reality is I had two or three pretty simple concepts in mind. One, I wanted them to appeal to just about everybody. That includes collectors, magicians, and card players. Also, I wanted the cards to represent what the TGW brand and this channel is about. So we took a lot of cues from the space around me to kind of make it feel like something that was familiar yet still unique. And the last question, Kashmiri Aussie asks, what's your next Kickstarter campaign? Do you have a theme for the deck? Kashmiri, we are actually hard at work with regards to that next Kickstarter campaign. You're just gonna have to be a little bit more patient, but just know that we are working on it and it's going to be awesome and I can't wait to share more details with you guys. Okay, well, there were a lot of questions I didn't get to, but hopefully I'll do another one of these Q&A segments soon. Congrats to DV, winner of the Revival Cycles show commemorative playing cards deck. Contact me via Instagram to claim your prize. All right, giveaway time times two. To win a Room 17 House of the Rising Spade deck, just click on the link in the description below and follow the directions. That's it. For a chance to win a Dynastine deck, one, like this video, two, be a subscriber to this channel, and three, comment below. Thank you all for watching. To check out my review of last year's Black Friday haul, click on the video that will appear right here. I've been The Gentleman Wake. As always, see you next time.